Well, good morning. Good Sunday morning. Welcome to church. My name is David Kenny, and I am the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. We have been going through a sermon series on the Holy Spirit, talking about who this Holy Spirit is, uh, what he means for our life, the different roles the Holy Spirit plays in our life, and just kind of finding ourselves in that and what it means for us as a church. And I know you all come to church, right? Uh, and some of us have, have probably been coming to church for ever, right? <laughs> and you almost feel weird if uh, Sunday goes by and you don't go to church. But maybe you don't ever stop to think about it because, you know, like I said, it's something we do all the time. But do you ever consider how weird church is? I mean, think about this. You come here or you attend, you know, the church where you live, and, and you go there to hear your pastor teach you about God. I think that's weird. Why? Well, because, I mean, I'm only 52, right? I'm only 52 years old. God has been alive since ever, right? And, and I don't even understand my own kids sometimes, so I certainly could not presume to teach you about parenting. I'm sure most of you know more about parenting than I do. And yet, I probably know as much about God as I do about parenting. I mean, how arrogant are pastors? <laughs> how arrogant are Bible teachers? I mean, sure, I went to school, I got a degree, I've read countless books, but in truth, what do I know? How do I explain God? God is the creator of the universe. And this is why so many people struggle with the Holy Spirit, because it's this unknown. And we want to know more. People struggle with uh, ideas about end times and revelation. People struggle with all kinds of theologies. So God, I don't think, is easy to always understand. And the Bible agrees with me. Isaiah 55 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Job 26, 14 says, Behold, these are but the outskirts of his ways, and how small a whisper do we hear of him, but the thunder of his power, who can understand? Deuteronomy 29, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may all do the words of this law. Psalm 147.5, great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. God made all of this, right? God made all of this. God made me. And now I'm supposed to just turn around and I'm going to explain him to you. Who am I? I mean, I might not even finish this sermon, right? If God doesn't like the way I'm going with it, or he doesn't agree with what I'm saying, I mean, God could strike me down before I even finish. My sermons are like the ramblings of an ant trying to describe a supercomputer. And now we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, an aspect of God people have written countless books about, studied extensively, and yet an aspect of God that I think is confusing and misunderstood. I mean, the word Father, we understand. The word Son, we understand. But words like Spirit and, and Ghost are weird to us. But we're doing our best, and, and we're going slow, week by week, you know, just defining some aspects of the Holy Spirit, the roles of the Holy Spirit. We said that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. We said that the Holy Spirit guides people to truth. We said the Holy Spirit glorifies God. We said that the Holy Spirit affirms that we are in the family. He breaks down barriers and he directs us in life. Now that seems like a lot. And, and those definitions, they're helping. They are, they're helping. And this is a good start. But this is God we're talking about. And he does so much more. Jesus says in John 14, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things 
and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. First, I want you to see, when Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit, he uses personal pronouns. Of course he does. The Holy Spirit is God, and God is not an it. God is a being. God has a mind. God has a personality. God has a wit. God has style. God is not a concept. God is not an understanding. God is not a theory. God is a sentient being. God is alive. Jesus says, he will teach you. Yes, I know, for the past weeks, we've been talking about the power of the Holy Spirit and the help that's available to you through the Holy Spirit, but just so long as we recognize that the Holy Spirit is still God, and God is not a tool to be used. He is not a good luck charm. He's not a special ingredient that you add to the mix. The Holy Spirit is a person. Romans 8 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So even P Paul here, in the author of Romans, he confirms, says the Holy Spirit has a mind. Paul writes a little further down the page, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. There you go. There's another role of the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? Well, we've been saying that the Holy Spirit lives in us, right? The Holy Spirit lives in you. That means the Holy Spirit knows us. If the Holy Spirit lives in us, then the Holy Spirit knows us intimately, right? Intimately. And so when it comes time to talk about the things that we need or the things that are best for us, well, then the Holy Spirit knows exactly what those things are. And so the Holy Spirit prays for us according to the will of God. And the Holy Spirit prays for what God would want in my life. I mean, sure, I pray for stuff, right? But again, <laughs> who am I? I? What do I know about what's best for me? I'm just some dumb 52-year-old. Oh, I know what to pray for. I know what's best for my life. Come on, don't make me laugh. I know we think we're all great prayers, but you're out there praying uh, that you catch a fish. You're out there praying that you shoot a 10-point buck. You're out there praying for a good golf score. You're praying for your kid's team so that they'll beat somebody else's kid's team. But what is the Spirit doing? The Spirit is interceding for me. The Spirit is praying to God for me for things I don't even know about. Deep things. I would say better things. The Holy Spirit has a mind and he uses that mind to know me and to pray for me. You know, some people ask their pastor to pray for them. Say, pastor, keep me in your thoughts. Pastor, pray for me. That's nice. It's always flattering to be asked, but don't ever forget that God prays for you. The Holy Spirit, who knows you intimately, prays for you. And so since the Holy Spirit is a person, and the Holy Spirit prays for you and knows you, that means the Holy Spirit has a will. 1 Corinthians 12 says, All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. The Holy Spirit has a will. And he gives everyone in this room a gift. He gives us a spiritual gift. What kind? Well, a spiritual gift that is best for us. Because he knows us. And because he knows us, he knows what's best for us. Well, you know, I've kind of always wanted the gift of helps. I've actually always wanted the gift of healing. Yeah, you don't get to pick. Your gift comes from the mind of the Spirit, and he knows you best. Remember, he prays for you. 
He and God have lengthy discussions about you. And then he gives you a gift that, what does the Bible say? He wills. He wills. Now, right now, there are 55 days until Christmas. You're welcome. And uh, at Christmas time, you will pick the gifts that you want to give to others. Now I know all the grandkids have an Amazon wish list and their parents say, just buy what's on the list. But as the gift giver, part of giving the gift is picking what you want to give. They don't get to pick. The receiver of the gift does not get to pick. Part of gift giving is knowing someone well enough that you give them the perfect gift. Now the Holy Spirit has his own will, his own way, and we follow, right? We follow. So whatever the Holy Spirit gives me is gonna be the best. And then I'm gonna show my appreciation for that gift when I use that gift to serve the kingdom. It's not my will be done, right? That's not what we pray. Jesus taught us to pray, thy will be done. And even Jesus, before the cross, prayed in the garden. He prayed to the Holy Father, thy will be done. Whatever you want to do, Lord. But the problem is we don't like to live that way. We like to be the captain of our own ship. We like to drive the car. We like to hold the remote. We want to be in charge. And perhaps we don't talk about the Spirit enough because the more we learn about the Spirit, the more we realize that as Christians, we should be submitting to the Holy Spirit. When Stephen gave his speech to the Jewish leaders in the book of Acts, he said, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so did you. So it's always been an issue. It's always been an issue. People have always resisted. People have always rebelled. You know, and you wonder why more people don't become a Christian. Why don't more people follow Jesus? Why don't more people see the truth? It's probably because they have trouble following. And yet the Bible famously says, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Jesus said, don't be surprised. Right? He said, you're going to turn around and you're not going to see a lot of people behind you. <laughs> the rest of the world wants to lead. They want to lead their own life. They pray for their own desires. They seek their own goals. They put themselves first. They live for themselves. But Christians, we enter by the way of baptism. We repent. We turn from our old way of life. We turn from those earthly desires and we follow Jesus. You know, there's a lot of great quotes about leadership, books about leadership and entrepreneurship, being a self-made person. Not as many great quotes about following, nor seminars about being a great follower. In fact, the only times you ever hear the word follow is when we say, follow your heart, follow your dreams. But that's still you following you. Being a Christian is following God. If the Holy Spirit's role is to lead me to truth and to direct my life, then that means my role is to follow. Okay, we've said the Holy Spirit has a mind. He's a person, not an it, right? He knows you. He prays for you. What else? Ephesians 4. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So again, Holy Spirit is a person. And since he is a person, that means that you 
can grieve God. You can sadden God. You can bring grief to the Holy Spirit. How is that possible? Well, think about this. Can your, can your children break your heart? Of course. And God has feelings. The Holy Spirit has feelings. Of course he does, because you have feelings, and you were made in God's image. It's not that God has feelings like you. You know, we often try to personify God. That's silly. You have feelings like God. And typically, when we think about God, uh, our, our pastors, in their arrogance, they try to teach you about God. We, we picture God as being strong and powerful and mighty, and so therefore, God doesn't have feelings. But feelings are not a sign of weakness. Think about it. Jesus cried, he bled, he felt emotions, he had friends, and so we paint picture of Jesus, we paint a picture of him as being frail and thin and meek and weak. There's a lot of skinny, you know, emaciated actors that have played Jesus. And yet, God is powerful. We have uh, pictures of him with visible muscles and a deep, booming voice and a long beard. But feelings are not a weakness. And the Bible says that you can sadden the spirit. You can make God sad. Well, I don't want to make God sad. Do you? I hope Paul told the Ephesian church how not to make God sad. I hope he left more advice. What does he say if we continue to read? He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. There you go. What makes you sad as a parent? As a parent, what makes you sad? Probably the same thing that makes uh, God sad. When you see your children fight with each other. What makes you sad as a teacher? When your students don't get along. What grieves you as a friend or a neighbor or a grandparent? when you see couples fight. How do you fix it? God says, get along. Get along. Tell me something. Do you think God is happy right now? According to this verse, is he happy right now in November of 2020? Is God looking forward to Super Tuesday? Is he happy with us as a country? Are God's children getting along. Ephesians 4 says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. How how dare us? (laughs) When we refer to each other with labels, when we hide behind colored states, when we draw lines in the sand and we yell, he's touching me, he's on my side, he's got a bigger cookie than me. That's not what any parent wants to hear. No, as a parent, you want to sneak into the back room and you want to find both kids happily playing with each other, sharing with each other, respecting each other. Not, well, they started it. Have we gotten rid of all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander? Or am I still learning to be kind to one another? As the Bible says, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave me. And and if not, why not? Because that's a command in the Bible. And when I don't do that, when I don't get along with my neighbor, the Bible says that I make God sad. Not someone else, me. I personally, 
I take responsibility for it. I make God sad. What am I supposed to do? The Bible says take it off. Take what off? Ephesians 4 says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, taken off of you, along with all malice. What is bitterness, wrath, and anger? Corruption, right? It's vulgar words. It's curse words. It's gossip. It's backstabbing. It's profanity. It's nasty statements. It's words that make your skin crawl when you hear them. What am I supposed to put on in their place? Words that build others up. Words that make people feel good. And it's not just about curse words. That's not what we're talking about. You can have corrupt language that doesn't have a single curse word in it. You can have unwholesome talk that doesn't have any profanity. In fact, if the Holy Spirit knows us and lives in us, he hears our corrupt thoughts, right? It, they don't even have to be words that come out of my mouth. He hears my corrupt thoughts inside of us, and God says, get rid of all of that. Get rid of all of that. Stop tearing down others by what you say. The Bible says God despises that sort of behavior. But why? I mean, that seems a little hypocritical uh, for God, after all. I mean, God gets angry. The Bible says that God hates things. Why does God hate my bitterness and my wrath and my anger? Well, let's think about this. Let's think this through. We said that the Holy Spirit knows us, right? And he knows us well enough to be able to pray for the things that we need. That means he knows a lot about us. He knows enough about us that he could probably say all kinds of mean and nasty things about us. He knows things that he could say about you when he prays to God for you. He knows things about you that you wouldn't want others to find out. But he doesn't. When you're praying for the things that you want in your ignorance and silliness, the Holy Spirit's not standing next to you saying, don't listen to him, God. You didn't see what he did this week. He's been bad. Don't give him what he wants. The Holy Spirit doesn't do that. He doesn't repeat those words about your past because he knows that in Christ you are forgiven. In Christ, all of your shameful behavior is erased. And since that's the case, that it's really inappropriate for me to gratefully accept him forgiving me and then for me to turn around and not forgive others. I mean, let's say you've been out in the garden, you've been digging in the dirt, you're pulling weeds, you're sweating up a storm, you get all done and you realize, oh no, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to go out and eat with friends tonight, so what do you do? Well, you go inside, you take off your dirty clothes, you take a shower, and then once you've toweled off, you're ready to go out the door. No, I hope not, because you're still not dressed. <laughs> they arrest people for going outside like that. Um, so what do you do? You have to put on clean clothes, right? Because it's not enough to take dirty clothes off and take a bath. You have to put on clean garments. And in the same way, it's not enough to repent and take off the sins of your past. You have to replace those sinful behaviors with something else. Galatians 3 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You have to put on clean deeds and clean thoughts and clean words. Ephesians 4 ends, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Be kind to one another. Be kind to one another. What is kindness? Kindness is something that flows from your heart. It's 
an action, but it's also a reaction to the needs of someone else. It's your heart that's moved to do something, whether it's uh, helping the lady in front of you who's struggling with her groceries, it's a choice to help a dad who's doing the best he can with three kids instead of criticize, oh, look how he parents. Kindness is you leaving a tip for your waitress, even though your service wasn't exceptional, but you can see, you know what? She looks exhausted. Kindness is a response to hatred. And it brings peace, not escalation. Kindness is not passing by on the other side of the road. Kindness is getting off your donkey and helping the beaten and the assaulted person in the ditch, even if they're not like you, even if they're your enemy, even if they stand on another side than you. Kindness comes from your heart. It's a feeling of mercy and compassion. It's funny to say compassion because compassion literally means to put yourself in the skin of the other. Which when you think about it, is exactly what God does for me in Christ. John 1.14 says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling place among us. In other words, God had compassion. God came he loved, he gave, he died because he had compassion. The bottom line is our Heavenly Father wants his kids to get along and it grieves him when we don't. And so, like we always say, it doesn't matter who started it. Forgiveness is the key to ending it. Forgiveness is the choice to love others instead of asking to be repaid. Forgiveness is the choice to be compassionate even when it's not given. Because forgiveness is exactly what God does for us. God chose kindness. And if we've received his kindness, then that should always be our choice too. You know, maybe it is possible. Maybe it is possible to understand God after all. Maybe the Holy Spirit isn't so hard to figure out. If we simply just think about how it would make us feel, what makes us sad, what brings us joy. But even after this reminder, and even after this sermon, I'm still not going to get it right. I'm still going to forget to be kind. I'm still going to forget to be compassionate. I'll return to anger and clamor and slander. So it's a good thing that when I'm busy praying for my golf game or that my kid catches a ball, it's a good thing the Holy Spirit knows me and that he's praying for what I really need. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come. We need more of you in our lives, more of your reminders, more of your conviction. We need you to lead us to truth, to guide our lives. Lord, when we feel lost, you remind us that we are part of the family. When we feel on the outskirts, you bring us back in. And every time we feel unwanted or unneeded, you remind us that you know us intimately. Holy Spirit, thank you for praying for me and for my life. I am always in search of people to pray for me, to pray for my needs. It's comforting to know that you take my innermost desires and my immediate needs to God, that you pray for the things that 
are most needed in my life. And I pray that you would unveil those things to me that I would know what I need. I want to know what I need. I want to know what's best for me. I don't want to run my life. I don't want to drive this ship. I want to follow. And whenever I lead, whenever I stand out in front, Lord, that's just my sin getting in the way. Put me in my place as many times as I need it. Help me to learn to be a follower. Help me to remember that you are my guide. Help me to learn submission. Lord, I'm sorry that I have not gotten along with my neighbor. I'm sorry that I have actively tried to separate myself from others, distanced myself from others at times. I have not done everything I can to walk across the room. I have not done everything I can to extend hands of fellowship and grace. I have looked for more reasons to cross my arms and turn up my nose and shake my head these past few months than ever before. Lord, I don't want to make you sad. I would rather have you be proud of me. So I have more work to do. I'm glad the Holy Spirit prays for me. Continue to mold me and shape me into the man, the woman, the son, the daughter, the child of God that you need me to be. I want to live my life following you. Thank you for your compassion. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your grace. I know it's not deserved. All of these things are gifts. Help me to use my gifts for you. Help me to see my week as my opportunity to give back. Help me to see my time here on Sunday morning as an opportunity for me to serve, that I might give you all of me as you have given all of you. Amen. Well, thanks for watching. Thanks for being here and having some time with us this Sunday morning. Of course, you know that this is a video out on YouTube and it has a URL, has an address up at the top. You can always clip and copy that and save it. You can uh, then post it to your own wall. If you want to share it with others, you can also post it to a friend's wall if you think it might be an encouragement for them. Uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next week. Bye.